Libertarians 2020 presidential candidate debate series. I'm Hody Johns. I'm your host, and I am joined by Arvin Vora, Benjamin Letter, Christopher Marks, Daniel Berman, is theft. and Kim and Kim Ruff. This is part of a series of 10 debates where every candidate for president is formally invited to participate and provide their ideas on a variety of issues, including the Republicans and Democrats. They've just elected to not participate in a debate hosted by Real Libertarians. Surprise that. This one will be discussing social issues. And your candidates, just like last time, you're going to have two minutes to answer the questions. Uh, I'm going to call on you in a random order. You'll have two minutes at the end of your allotted time. I'll just simply say time and wrap up your, uh, wrap up your thought quickly. If you're done early... Just say yield and we'll move on to the next question or the next uh, candidate. While I am a libertarian, I have designed these questions to be challenging and have modeled both the questions and the format after the major presidential debates, not the friendly formats that you might be used to. My audience is tasked with evaluating the quality of your responses. Me personally, I will be judging you based on how prepared you are for the challenges that I po propose, how well you understand the question that I set before you, and how well you manage your time, as well as how com compelling your answers are to make all Americans and not just libertarians want to vote for you. At the end, you'll be given three minutes to issue a closing statement, with which you can summarize your feelings about social policies, challenge an opponent's response to a question, and or address an issue that you didn't feel got brought up in the debate. As we've decided to incorporate, there will be a little bit of open forum after the questions and before we get to your closing statements. So candidates, here we go. I have only one question about abortion during this debate, but it's gonna be a big one. Until last year, many voters thought that it was a good middle ground position on abortion to let the states decide for themselves. However, after a wave of new legislation has become apparent that the state solutions are at times even more horrifying than the federal solutions. In Alabama, pro-choice activists watched in horror as a 14-year-old girl was forced to not only carry a fetus to term, but also subsequently co-parent a child with her 26-year-old rapist. In New York, pro-life advocates were shocked to see late-term abortions carried out complete with rampant documentation, documented circumstances of fetuses gasping for air, crying out, and clutching their little hands as doctors were required to snuff these lives out. With the two wildly polar opposites becoming law in different states, it seems more apparent than ever that a Supreme Court ruling is just imminent. As president, you will not be able to change these laws, but your rhetoric and the stands of your justices that you appoint will shape this issue more than any other person in the United States. Tell us what you will express to the public about abortion and what you will be looking for in the Supreme Court justices that you will appoint. And we will start with Christopher Marks. I've actually had a lot of um, thought into this conversation. As a family rights activist, this is something that's a very hot topic conversation for us. Um, and I see both a, in, you know, in these debates, we've unilaterally come to the conclusion that that cookie cutter government box decision doesn't work for all. Um, I don't think that the government should be involved to this in these conversation kinds of decisions on whether or not abortion can be had or cannot be had. Rather, instead, I think that this is something that we need as a society to come to a call, a, we create a cultural change, as Adam Forrest or Arvin Forrest typically used to say. Um, if we came to the understanding that it is a woman's body and it is a woman's choice on what she does with her body, but on the other side, the man has the choice on whether or not to be with a woman that would or would not actually have an abortion with his child uh, of his child. I think that we can all come to the understand that there is that are consequences for that choice that you could be had and that also, if you as the male underneath this situation where a woman has the choice to either opt into or opt out of being a parent, so should men have the ability to opt in or opt out of being a parent of a child that they may have wanted to have a, be aborted, that, they cho uh, that the mother, um, in fact, chose not to. Great. So, let's, uh, all right. Awesome. Let's pass that next one on to Arvin Vora. Localization is not the answer. 
States' rights are not the answer. County rights are not the answer. This is not just true in abortions. It is true in every single subject. Education is mishandled by the federal government, yes, but it's mishandled worse by state governments. Passing power from the federal governments to the states, while popular with some supposed libertarians, is not an improvement. It is a lateral move. The only way to make this a real improvement is to make this purely an individual choice. Today, our instincts, our impulses have been so deformed by the welfare state that parents are not even, wor- are not even interested in providing for their own kids. It's not, a, it's not an unusual thing for there to be dads who refuse to pay for their own kids. To me, as a men's rights activist, that is unnatural. It is unnatural to not, not want to provide for your own kids. The entire human race, the entire animal kingdom knows that you provide for your own kids. The parents are supposed to give their own kids every advantage they can. And that's been deformed by the existence of the welfare state. Abortions today, the, the situation we have is a tragedy. There are way too many abortions. My view on abortion in particular, should it be handled by the states? No, it shouldn't be handled by the states or the federal government. It should be left to each person's individual conscience. Because the simple fact is that when a person knows that it is their conscience that needs to make a decision, they take it as a moral decision. Whereas when they're fighting against an an absurd state law, their own conscience goes out the window and is replaced by a kind of brute utilitarian pragmatism. So no, I don't support states' rights. I don't support federal rights. I support only individual rights when it comes to abortions. And I believe that each individual should make that as a moral choice. My view, abortion is wrong. I don't support it as an individual choice. But I want other people to individually come to that choice, not to be forced by the state, the federal state, or local government. Great. Two minutes on the button. Let's pull that over to Benjamin Letter. We've been arguing about abortion for well longer than I've been alive. Um, you say we need another Supreme Court ruling. Uh, this isn't this isn't even the first time. Um, abortions is, is kind of like uh, any other prohibition item. Um, people are going to do that regardless of uh, you know, what is legal. And what is not, just like uh, folks uh, buy drugs uh, and uh, hire sex workers and uh, all kinds of other um, things that are illegal that uh, are actually pretty commonplace in society and have been for a long time. Uh, you know, abortions didn't just come around uh, with the invention of, of today's modern surgery. People have been using uh, uh, herbs uh, and all kinds of uh, home remedies and things. Uh, for well over a thousand years. Um, so it seems like a silly thing to attempt to implement a prohibition on. I don't think that uh, that's a, an effective way of solving a problem for the folks that um, have an issue with, with uh, you know, some of the, the tragedies that are the result of, of abortion. I don't think that that's necessarily effective. I think that we have a, a lot of other effective routes uh, that can be taken. We talk about uh, adoption. You know, Kim Ruff made an excellent post the other day that covered, you know, a lot of these topics. Welcome um, Facebook. I just don't think. Buddy John's here. I'm We're probably going to say the podcast. same thing everyone here is going to say. Is that I don't think the government should be involved in this. This is a medical issue. If we have medical privacy, uh, then the government shouldn't be uh, intruding upon uh, that medical privacy. Um, now, albeit, you know, I don't think anybody here wants to see, uh, you know, uh, <clears throat> this happening, and, and would like uh, adoption to uh, to be, uh, right. you know, deregulated to uh, to a point where uh, that could be uh, more of a solution. All right, let's pass that along to Daniel Berman. Um, Dan, taxation is theft, Berman, and. Uh, it, this is this is another um, instance of where my middle name is actually very important here. So, um, of course, I'm going to say taxation is theft. What does taxation have to do with this conversation at all? This conversation is not about pro-life, pro-choice. That's what they give us. And that's those are the two sides that they tell us. But really, we're just fighting against each other, knocking our heads against the wall. That's not what this conversation is about. This conversation is about control. Ask the pro-life people. Are you really pro-life when they support 
uh, bombing innocent children on the other side of the world. Ask the pro-choice people if they're pro-choice when it comes to other questions that might come up in anybody's life of should the government have control over what you can or can't do. It's not pro-choice or pro-control. It's limited to this one discussion. And because of that, we're all we're doing is we're spending all this energy fighting each other and not looking at the real problem. Why? Why do most abortions happen? Why are they even a consequence of, why is it even a question? Why should we have these abortions? And we hear about rape and incest and, and um, all, these, all these terrible things that happen. And we say, well, that's why it should be legal. That makes up such a small percentage of these things. The, the huge percentage of these abortions are coming from people who don't have enough money. They're in poverty or their cost of living is too high. Why? Because of taxes. Taxes are the reason people are struggling to pay their rent. They're struggling to have a place to live. They're struggling to feed themselves. And of course, they have another child along the way. Of course, they're going to struggle to have to feed that child and provide everything that every other expense that they need for this, putting them through school, all these other things. This all comes down to taxes. You get rid of the taxes and people are able to live more comfortably with more of the things that they need. Now, another interesting thing about this is this is about control. It's understandable that when somebody wants to say that they're pro-choice, they don't want to be controlled. They don't want to have somebody tell them, hey, this is how you have to live your life. And so it's not necessarily about, hey, I want to go around murdering babies. Now, for some people, that might be the case, but that's not necessarily why all these people want this. Um, they, they just don't want it. They're, it's opposition of control, and that's completely understandable to want that. So we have to we have to look at this conversation on a completely different level and we need to change the conversation about what it's really about. And we need to look to why most of these abortions are happening and just change it right. so that that's not even a question. OK, uh, let's have it closed with Kim Ruff. OK, <laughs> thank you for relinquishing control of the mic, Dan. <laughs> Uh, there's uh, the guy, you guys have done a really good job of summarizing so many different aspects of this very complex issue. So I'm just going to build on the foundation that you've already laid with a couple other aspects. And we're going to talk about it from the perspective of the ideological principles that undergird libertarianism and how this issue is difficult to solve running it through the non-aggression principle and why we default to what we do. By and large, we believe in the natural rights to life, liberty, and justly acquired property. But there is no medical consensus on when life begins. So it is relegated to one of personal belief, whether it's based on religious doctrine, your own personal values, whatever the case may be, we are drawing lines of demarcation based strictly on what we personally feel is the inception of life, as opposed to what is medically agreed upon. So we're saying then at that point, is it life indeed based on our personal beliefs or is it property? Does it belong to the woman who's holding this fetus in their womb is it property? And are we violating those property rights? Or is this life that we're violating and we have to defend it? That is the challenge that we have to face, that we deal with. And since we can't resolve this ideologically based on our own principles, then we default to effectively what we always do, which is self-ownership and personal responsibility. Those are two major linchpins of being a libertarian. We believe in self-ownership. That's why we're vehemently opposed to having a collection of people or elected representatives wearing funny hats dictating to us how we must live based on their personal morality. So we say that you own yourself. Government has no right to tell you what to do with yourself. And you have personal responsibility because you have self-ownership. To draw that line of distinction and to adhere to your personal beliefs and to do the right thing. If we eliminate government in this particular issue, we stop trying to resolve it by compelling and coercing other people to behave in a manner that was more consistent with what we personally leave, I think that people would be more inclined to not only have greater freedom of economy, but they would also have more inclination to make better choices with the aid of those in their community and family. All right. Promised only one abortion question. Good job, candidates. Let's move on. Let's get to ones that are maybe more fun. Recent in terms of our country's history, LGBT couples were granted the opportunity to adopt children, albeit with extra restrictions over straight couples. Trans couples and polyamorous couples still face huge uphill battles when it comes to adopting children. Currently, there are more than enough parents looking for children than there are even children to adopt. However, 
Well, it might seem like removing background checks and restrictions are a good idea. Adopted children face abuse, violence, and homicide rates far higher than traditional children. How will your policies or ideas help good parents find the children they need while we discourage bad par parents from adopting? And we will start where we left off, Kim Ruff. On oh, nerds. <laughs> okay. As far as adoption goes, I don't think that there are any bureaucrats who are going to be able to ascertain the ideal formula for determining what makes a loving and stable home. I don't think that we can honestly say that an LGBT, uh, you know, an LGBTQ couple is going to somehow be worse parents than a heterosexual couple or that a child who's with a foster family is going to be less healthy of a loving relationship than what they would have had with their biological polyamorous couples or not couples at that point. I mean, large family units, however one wants to compose their home, provided they're able to exercise their beliefs and be as honest and authentic to themselves, they are going to create a loving and stable environment. If we stop trying to dictate how people are supposed to behave and act, they will create that home and that atmosphere that will be much better for children. There's no policy or one size fits all panacea that's going to make that right. I think we absolutely should get rid of restrictions on adoption. And I do think that if we did do so, we would have a hell of a lot less abortions because more people would have opportunities. All right, let's move that question over to Christopher Marks. Wow. Um, hi, uh, family rights activist, adamantly opposed to CPS. Um, CPS is actually one of the leading contributors to those foster children that are looking to be adopted. Why? Because the state agents have actually committed perjury, fraud, and kidnapped those children and now are trying to human traffic them. Um, I am adamantly opposed to forced adoption. Um, it is no different than the, than the cultural genocide that was committed to the American Indian people through the American Indian boarding school practice practices. Now let's get to the to the root of the question that was asked. Um, should there be additional constraints on someone due to their sexual preferences or lifestyle preferences? Absolutely not. Voluntary adoptions, I think it's a, an excellent solution to, um, a, to, as an alternative to having an abortion. Um, Additionally, uh, we need to do some serious issues in regard to who we allow to actually foster these children. It, in many states, actually, according to what the most of the parental rights activists um, all across the United States inform me, that pedophiles, registered sex offenders, can in fact be foster parents to our children. That's what contributes, contributes to foster children being six times more likely to face abuse, uh, molestation, and end up murdered in foster care. So, uh, yeah, I not I would rem I would place some more strict re restrictions on who could foster children. I would remove limitations for voluntary foster uh, uh, or for voluntary adoption. And but we need to take a serious hard look at CPS. All right, let's pass this along to Arvind Vora. This to me looks like the dominant heterosexual traditional marriage paradigm, seeing the moat in the other side's eye and ignoring the log in their own. Today, most heterosexual monogamous couples have not fulfilled the roles of parents. They are living off of welfare and government schools are absolutely a type of welfare. They have not achieved the bare minimum requirement for parenting, which is to provide for their kids. Today, we're talking about 50 million families put their kids into government schools, into welfare schools. And for them to have the audacity to say that this perfectly financially solvent a gay couple or polyamorous group or whatever isn't fit to raise a child is preposterous. I believe that, adopt, that adopting a child should be handled purely by the free market. It should be no different than buying a used car where there's a clearinghouse, there's a place to buy it, people are checking to make sure that they're safe. Somebody who's putting their kids up to adoption through this private agency 
can go to the agency that says, listen, we are going to do some kind of a check. We're going to make sure that it's not a, a pedophile or sex trafficker who's adopting your child. And that free market will and already does work. I mean, already there's a free, there's a black free market. There's an underground free market for adoptions as it, as it stands right now, uh, just as there is for, any, for anything else that the government tries to get involved in. The government should have absolutely no involvement in adoption whatsoever. If you want to pay somebody to adopt a child or somebody wants to pay you to adopt their child, that's your natural right. There should be no restrictions of any kind except for those put in by the free market, which say this, if you are going to be a parent, you need to be able to actually provide for your child, not rely on welfare. All right. Two minutes on the button. Let's move over to Daniel Berman. I got my timer. I think I went over last time. I couldn't hear you. Um, You're good. So, uh, yeah, this is an interesting question, and it, it comes down to government control again. Should the government control what people can or can't do? And the answer is always no. There's a question of, oh, but then you're going to have gay couples adopting children, and then they're going to have these terrible lives. Well, there are plenty of straight parents who are not acceptable parents either. As a matter of fact, there are plenty of parents who give birth to genetic offspring who are their own, who don't go through any kind of adoption process, and they're terrible parents. What are we going to do about that? Should we have some government agency running around inspecting all of the parents? Should we have governments give interviews to all of the parents before they even give birth to these children to make sure that they don't grow up in bad homes? Of course not. This is absolutely insane. If somebody wants to raise a child, it should be the, the if anything, if you're going to give your child to somebody else, you should make sure that they're good people. And that's really the end of it. You don't need to, it doesn't matter what their orientation is, what they like to do. Maybe they like mountain climbing. Maybe they like bicycling. None of this matters. None of it matters. They're going to raise these children. Whether or not you trust these people to give them a good education, to teach them right from wrong, these are the important things that we should be looking at. And when you, when I say you're going to be giving your children to these people, consider that. I mean, think about it. Like if, if you're against giving, if you're against gay parents adopting children, don't give your children up for adoption and then you don't have to worry about it for your children. There are plenty of worse circumstances that we should be focusing on in this world today than whether or not somebody's going to adopt and teach something that's that's so irrelevant in the big picture. All right, great. Let's close with Benjamin Letter. You know, uh, another big... Uh, Pet adoption is really big in this country, and it's become really successful. And it it's not really regulated by government. Um, and a lot of people get involved in it. And uh, whole communities come come together to make sure that these that these pets are are cared for and and find what they call their their forever home. Um, I don't see why we can't. Uh, streamline this up by getting the government out of the way uh, and now as far as like uh, the sexual preference or the I guess whatever uh, kink or lifestyle questions I'm not going to pretend to be a mother that's ever carried a, a child to term uh, and committed to do that uh, and plan to give said child up for adoption but I'm just going to go ahead and assume that most uh, women that would choose to do that would be uh, interested in uh, knowing perhaps who uh, who the parents were going to be, uh, interview them, um, and if uh, those parties were able to come to uh, an agreement uh, and they liked each other, uh, I don't see why the government should be involved. Uh, they don't have to be involved in pets, uh, and really the, the pet adoption uh, business or industry has really done more uh, to fight pet abuse than probably anybody else. Um, so I think that the market would take care of this issue if, if government was to become uninvolved and, and, and let people make their own decisions. All right. Thank you, candidates. Moving on to the next one. Marriage is not always a state institution. Personal and private marriages often made no clause for what happened with children or possessions after a divorce. But as the population grew and divorce rates increased, 
States began to regulate marriage so as to facilitate the divorce process. Would you prefer to deregulate marriage entirely and go back to the problems of before, fix up the approval process now to iron out any existing biases, or do you have other means of addressing the marriage inequality issue and or state control of marriage issue? And let's start with uh, Christopher Marks. Wow, it's like you uh, engineered this whole debate in my wheelhouse. Um, okay, uh, first off, yes, uh, the ever-increasing divorce rate within the United States is what actually facilitated the demand for the states to become involved. And when those states became involved, they went to the federal government, to get, and they stuck their welfare baby hands up in the air, and they said, federal government, please give me some of that very lucrative social security uh, trust fund money. And the federal government said, sure enough, here you go. Um, this is the reason why child support enforcement and as well as CPS practices is actually one of the largest contributors to the 50, over $50 billion a year mismanagement of your social security trust funds. What causes marital problems most of the time? In my research, money financial insecurity within the within the uh, private relationship of the two parties has been the pro, uh, has been a overwhelming contributor to what causes a relationship to break down and as we can go to tax uh, dan taxation is theft and uh, ask him what is the largest contributor to actually impoverishing the american people it is our government sticking their hands into our wallets and taking from us what is ours. So if we limited our government, we cut down what is the redundancy of government agencies, um, we uh, cut off the, the uh, federal mismanagement of your, the people's social security trust funds, and we left the states out it high and dry without being financially incentivized to continue can causing a controversy to occur within our family court systems then they would say there's no money in this and we're out time good timing uh let's move that along to benjamin letter I don't know if I need to spend a lot of time on this one. Um, why is the government involved in, in marriage in the first place? So they can get a fee. They're not involved in every, in every other uh, you know, contract. If, if I want to buy something or sell something, or if we want to, uh, you know, make an arrangement, they don't have to be involved in that. Um, I don't think the government should be involved in, in personal relationships. That's all there is to it. All right. Short and sweet. Let's uh, let's uh, get Kim Ruff's thoughts on this. It's pretty simple, Hody. I don't think that the government has any business dictating who can get married or what they what folks want to define their relationships as. That is entirely their business, and if they choose to go the religious route, then that is strictly between them and whatever religious institution they seek. There should be no greater benefits conferred upon people who get a marriage license than there are in any other pairing. And people shouldn't be denied the opportunity to be the legal power of attorney or the medical power of attorney or get the same sort of considerations or be on each other's insurance than anyone else if they so desire. It, is, it has nothing to do with the state and the state shouldn't be involved. And I yield my time. Okay. Arvind Vora, would you care to elaborate? Well, I first want to disagree with a little bit of the of the history over there, because one of the major impetuses behind the marriage licensing movement was actually to ban interracial marriages. And that and that is a very critical part of the history. That, that is marriage licenses have a very ugly history in the United States. It then continues to a modern era of total and absolute barbaric incompetence. The default has become in many states uh, in, in divorce courts, especially when dealing with children that the following arrangement happens where the dad, the father, gets the, the, the right to pay 
and the mother gets the right for custody, which sounds like something out of a fable. You know, like I think I, I once read a fable of two brothers where they had to share a cow and the evil brother basically said, I'm going to take all the milk and you get to deal with the front half of the cow and feed the cow. I mean, it, it's, a, it's an idiotic bargain. The idea that you don't get your kids, but you do get to pay for them is insane and absurd. That's what the state is doing. I can't imagine anything being more poorly handled than that, nor can I imagine anything with an uglier history than state-involved marriage license. The high divorce rate speaks for itself. That is a 60% failure rate over something that doesn't work. And I don't think that's bad. I think that when people leave an unhappy situation, when people stand up for themselves, I don't think that's a wrong thing to do. I think if you're in the wrong place, you should leave. And a lot of, and a lot of the toxic marriages... We're, have now are now able to end more easily because you know people have rights, they have more financial solvency, they have more financial ability, etc. Uh, so I don't see that as a problem, but I also don't see the government being involved as having helped anything at all. What I want to see is getting the government completely out of all aspects of marriage between any gender and any number of consenting adults. You should be able to do whatever you want as long as you don't use any welfare to do it. Thank you. Uh, let's close with Daniel Berman. So uh, this is a really interesting topic and I've talked to a lot of people and I asked them, what is marriage? And the first thing everybody says is it's an institution. What the fuck does that mean? Like it's this word, it's this rhetoric that people have. Marriage is an institution. What's an institution? And nobody can define it. Most people can't define it. Um, it's, it's rhetoric. It, it means absolutely nothing. The reality is it's it's a government scheme to get people signed up to the government so the government can start keeping better track of you and, and all these other things. Um, when you start having children, that's all kind of woven into the system now. Um, of course, when we talk about uh, divorce, like Arvin was talking about, there are all kinds of rules and regulations that now control your relationship. Now, a lot of I ask a lot of people, why do you want to get married? And some people say, well, because I want to show my love for another person and, and we want to be together forever. Okay, fine. That's great. That's a great reason. Why do you need government for that? And then they say, oh, well, uh, we get a tax discount. No, that's actually a myth. Um, in some cases, you might. But in most families today where you've got uh, both uh, both people in the marriage working, uh, you're you really don't get a tax break for that. It's it's kind of a myth. Um, there are some things where like, oh, you get to make metal, medical decisions if someone else gets sick. A lot of that you can do with power of attorney. Um, you don't need the government to get married. In fact, I myself am married without government. And the great thing about this is that they, like, I don't, free people don't ask for permission. I don't need the government's permission to spend the rest of my life with somebody that I want to spend the rest of my life with. It's just not even a question. Why would I want to do that? Why would I want to get the government involved? Okay, thank you. Sorry to those of you in Salt Lake City. We've gone dark there because you use the F word, Dan. Appreciate <laughs> that. Uh, no, that's all right. We always get more hits when I'm ever, ever I'm able to put explicit in the title of this. So I, I appreciate that, I'll actually. I'll drop a couple more. No, okay. Thank you. Thank you. I want to sound like a Slim Shady album after this. Okay, let's move along. Let's talk about baking the cake. Shop owners are granted public protections in exchange for providing public goods and services. In the current climate, these laws are inextricable unless you intend to, to um, unless you also intend to provide uh, protection or prosecution against theft and fraud, or drop those laws involving threat that protect people against theft and fraud. So, would you rather force a shop owner to provide services to all people indiscriminately, even if his or her her personal code of conduct would ordinarily discriminate against some of them, or would you rather force the public? to pay for protection for this bigoted shop owner or protection from the, to, for themselves from fraud from this said shop owner in order for them to practice their craft on their terms. And we will start with Arvind Vora. Uh, there, there's a few contention points I have with that description. The first is the idea that if we didn't have police, that most bakeries would be under this constant threat of roving gay gangs, I don't think is a realistic description of any kind of possible likely reality. Uh, the What the police do today is just not protect. It's not protect and serve. Maybe if it, they did do that, I might have a higher opinion of them, but they don't. 
Uh, primarily, you see them wasting time and money with speeding tickets, and most states have become dependent on the revenue from speeding tickets. If you actually get robbed, they don't do anything. That's covered by private insurance. Private insurance already covers that, and the police don't do anything other than show up in a silly-looking costume and write a report about it. So, so first, I don't think that the police do what, what you're suggesting that they do. In terms of the rights of the baker, and this is something that, that, that I've spoken on, on, on a few times from both angles. One, I, if you want to turn down service to anybody for any reason, that's your right. I've never yet met a business owner who's so financially flush that they can go around turning, or turning away business left and right. As a business owner myself, I can't imagine a situation where I would say, no, 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 I don't like your sexuality, so I'm not taking your money. I mean, that is ridiculous. So if you want to turn down money, by all means, but understand that other people are going to take that money from you. And in a VOR administration, if you then come looking for welfare because your business predictably failed because you kept turning away customers, you're not going to get any welfare. So as long as there's no welfare of any kind, if you want to be to discriminate based on race or whatever, go ahead. Right now, many of us, uh, many in the libertarian community are being discriminated against by Facebook and other places. We've been deplatformed because Facebook doesn't like our ideas. That's Facebook's right, but it also puts Facebook at a threat. And I do believe that just as in the case with the baker, it's just making it easier for their competition to eventually, and I hopefully soon, replace them. Awesome. Let's get the thoughts from Daniel Berman. So the, the kind of the presumption on the argument that somebody should be forced to do something for you um, is the presumption that you have a right to their labor. So, you know, we talk about desegregation and, and um, uh, you know, these types of things. And we have to realize, like when we were talking about um, desegregation in the South a long time ago, those were actually government rules that were put in place that, that we were getting rid of. Um, when we talk about um, if somebody wants to discriminate in their business, let them. Because the reality is, I mean, think about it. If somebody hates you because of your race or your religion or your skin color, your, your gender, if they hate you, do you really want to give them your money? I mean, that seems like an idiotic thing to do to me. Um, I don't think anybody should want to do this. And I think when we see people do these things, they're kind of like lawsuit surfing. They're looking for like, hey, who can I sue to make some money? oh, this shop, they don't want to cater to me. I'm going to go ask them. And when they refuse me, then I'm going to sue them and I'm going to get some money. I'm going to get some attention. That's, that's really what this is. Because the reality is you do not have a right to this person's labor. The, you, don't, you don't have the right to force this person to open a cake shop in the first place to make you a cake. If they're overbooked, if they want to turn, turn away business just because they don't like you, maybe because you said something about them on Twitter, maybe because of whatever, maybe it's because of the color of your skin. Fine, let them, let them be, sorry, <laughs> let them be a-holes. I almost dropped a little A-bomb there. Um, <laughs> and, and let them be, and then go and talk crap about them on Twitter and do that and, and let their business fail because of that. But you don't need to force them and you don't need to send police to their organization, to their, to their place of business and force them with a court order to do your bidding and force and, and act like their labor is your property and you have a right to it because you don't. Daniel Berman, the candidate that almost dropped the A-bomb. I like that. Let's, uh, <laughs> let's get some thoughts from Christopher Marks on this. Okay. Um, I think that the biggest thing that I have a problem with here is the fact that there's a difference between a, an individual's right to contract and free a, 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 an individual enterprise as well as a, versus those who are acting in a corporate capacity that have those corporate uh, those corporate liability limitations, um, wherein what we this is what we see within pharmaceutical companies when pharmaceutical companies manufacture a drug that ends up killing people uh, an individual or maybe a swath of individuals, um, and they are not criminally prosecuted and held accountable for their crimes of murder. Um, so I, as a constitutionalist, I go back to constitutional strict scrutiny. Uh, summary of the Constitution and government privilege is the government has the limited privilege to govern over, aka regulate, those who are acting in a corporate capacity through the Commerce Clause and those who have committed a crime as defined by corpus delecti. Um, 
this in this situation is this case, is this bakery an individual enterprise or do they have corporate protections and limited liabilities if they have corporate protections and limited liabilities then yes in fact they if the government has the ability and and justly so should say you cannot discriminate against who you are serving your product However, if it's an individual enterprise and their free right to contract, then no, the government doesn't have the limited privilege to get involved in that private contracting situation. Um, to say that we're going to go ahead and put a hands off on this, time. all you have to do is look at the southern states and see what happened during the time periods of segregation. Thank you. No worries. Let's go to Benjamin Letter. I thought this was ridiculous in 2016. Uh, I think it's ridiculous now. Uh, I, I was sitting here a moment ago asking myself, why, why are we all in up in everybody's business? And, and like Daniel said, would you want a cake or a pizza from a guy that didn't like you? I wouldn't eat that. And it's it just, here's the thing. We're supposed to be a free country, right? Yet the taxes are taken out of your check before your check even goes to the bank. And, and then now you don't even have the, the right to say, uh, I, no, I'm not gonna serve this person. That sounds a whole lot like slavery to me. Um, and it just it doesn't feel like a good direction to go. I think uh, if, if you have a business, you can run the business the, the way that you want to. And if you, or a customer at that business and you don't like them go somewhere else and if there's if there's nowhere else to go in your town it sounds like they need some competition so maybe you and your friends can organize a you know a venture to compete against them that's, that's really all there is to it okay great uh if you are listening to us on facebook live and you would and you have a social question for the candidates we actually are going to do an open forum and i will shoot him uh if there are any questions or comments or anything you're wanting to voice that we're going to talk about those so uh, voice them now and i'll get get to look over those while that we go through these uh these back four questions here all right next question oh Excuse i skip me. i skip kim ruff entirely <laughs> kim bring us home on that Bake the cake. are you part of the bipartisan coalition that does the debates buddy <laughs> I am, blatant act of sexism i am <laughs> oh god no <laughs> Okay. Well, the funny thing about this particular segment of our debate is that there is probably not a darn thing any of us sitting here today are going to have wildly divergent viewpoints on. We're absolutely of the mind that this is the reality about a truly free society, that you don't truly owe anyone anything unless you want to actively give it with your consent. If you don't want to give it, that's absolutely your right. And that goes for business owners and property owners and anyone else. You are the king of your castle. It's your domain. It's your rule, your house, your rules. And if people don't like it, they have every right not to associate with you. And in the case of businesses, it's going to hurt you economically. And you have a choice to either pivot your business model or run the risk of dying as a business altogether. So we're already on the same page there. What I want to talk about just to add a little more extra commentary is the difference between negative rights and positive rights, because this is something that we disagree on the larger political platform with people that identify as Republicans or Democrats. As I've already covered, negative rights mean that you have the right to life, liberty, and property. And that means the society has an associated duty to not murder, not enslave, and not steal from you. Basically, society has a duty to do nothing. There's no active effort. Whereas positive rights are that you are entitled to something, that society has a duty to do something for you. And there in that sticky concept are the question of, well, to what extent and how much? How do we ensure your compliance? Who's making the determination of what should be done? And no one is ever gonna entirely agree. But the one thing we can all pretty much agree on, unless we're a sociopath, is you don't murder, you don't steal, and you don't enslave other people. So if we remember that as we make political decisions, and I'm not just talking about us as libertarians, but I'm talking about everyone who chooses to be involved in government in some way, shape, or form, if they remember that, then they won't even get into stupid debates like this. No offense to you, Hody, you're amazing. 
They won't even talk about these issues because these are irrelevant and foolish and political red herrings. I have three more debates, and on one of them, I'm not going to forget to ask somebody a question. It, I feel it coming. I was thinking this is going to be the one, but maybe it's next week. Oh, no, no, I want it now. I want it now. <laughs> <laughs> well, I know. I did, too. I did, too. I wanted it out, too. Anyway, uh, let's go. Let's move on to the next question here. <clears throat> Advocates for and against the death penalty both agree that reform must happen, but disagree on how it must happen. If the pro-capital punishment people have their way, fewer resources will be used due to a quicker punishment. However, the state will also have the ability to execute criminals. On the other hand, if the anti-capital punishment people have their way, the burden on the taxpayer will be heavier due to keeping murderers and rapists alive on the taxpayer's dime. What reform will you push for while you were in office? What type of legislation would you hope to see on this? And I will start once again with Arvind Vora. Let's start with the with this underlying idea that the major cost right now is keeping murderers alive. That that is not the bulk of law enforcement costs at all. Most of our prisons are jammed with nonviolent offenders. As president, the first thing that I'm going to do is I'm going to pardon. Uh, well, first I'm going to pardon Julian Assange, Ross Ulbricht, and Edward Snowden. Then I'm going to pardon every single nonviolent drug user, nonviolent drug seller, nonviolent drug trafficker. A nonviolent drug kingpin like Ross Ulbricht, everybody who's only in jail for a weapons charge, and everybody who's there just for a cryptocurrency type charge. And right there, you're going to see a huge co uh, uh, savings in cost. I mean, that, that's a huge cost reduction right there. In terms of capital punishment, the the actual the appeals process and the whole process of that is is so expensive that you're not really saving a lot of money. But but even if you were saving a lot of money, there's a very deep moral question in here and also a question of competence. I don't trust the government to do anything. The government can't handle basic, the most basic level of law enforcement properly. Instead of actually protecting us on the streets, what do they do? They waste our time and money using silly speeding tickets and nonsense like that. Instead of actually dealing with the backlog of rape kits, which is literally evidence collected after a rape, they're just spending all of those resources going after nonviolent drug offenders. Uh, most recently, a, hundred, a unanimous con congressional vote decided that the government should spend its resources not on going after actually trafficked kids, no, 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 but actually going after dolls, sex dolls that look like kids. And while I would agree that that's gross and weird, it's an idiotic way to spend law enforcement money. The government does not have the competence to do something like this. I don't trust them to do anything, let alone to make decisions of life and death. And if you look at how they've made those decisions, you see huge biases in race, economic ability, that capital punishment has not been done fairly or justly at all. And so I do not support the government being involved in capital punishment at all. I'm O for my last three on Arvin liking my questions, you guys. It's starting to hurt my feelings. <laughs> and apparently my sex doll is gross and weird. Let's move this over to... I'm kidding. Uh, let's move this over to Benjamin Letter, please. If you're going to kill somebody and you're going to claim that it's an act of justice, you better damn well sure be right. And the government's batting average is, is less than perfect here. Um... And we have a lot of cases where we have, you know, evidence that hasn't been tested and, and all this kind of stuff. And we have celebrities, uh, you know, petitioning governors to, to pardon. And both Democrats and Republicans never fails. Look, look how hard their hearts are. How, how often do you see a Democrat or a Republican governor uh, actually uh, put a stay uh, you know, on, on a case and say, okay, wait, we're, 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 we're not going to execute this guy just yet. We're going to actually finish doing our due diligence first. How often do you see that? It's rare. They need to all be replaced. Thank you, Benjamin. Let's move along to Kim Ruff. Well, I am vehemently opposed to capital punishment. I don't think that the state should have any any control whatsoever or any decision-making ability about who is guilty enough to be put to death. And I don't buy into the nonsense that the lion's share of our tax dollars are going to be spent on keeping people in prison for greater terms than were they to be put 
on death row. As it stands, the average person on death row is there for 20 to 25 years waiting to be executed. It's not like they're exactly judged guilty and then immediately put to the gallows. So that's absurd. If we really want to cut down on the cost of incarceration, maybe we need to overhaul our laws and get rid of all the reasons why we're putting people in prison in the first place. Considering the fact that the bulk of people in prison right now are there for nonviolent, victimless crimes because of the war on drugs, that would mitigate a huge burden that's being placed on the taxpayer. So I don't know. I'm not, I am so against the death penalty. And I, it's, it's insane. Since we overturned the death penalty, the moratorium on it in 1972, we have realized that we have put approximately 10 people of the 14, 1,400 that have been put to death were found to be posthumously innocent. In addition to 144 people who were exonerated while sitting on death row. That is not an acceptable margin of error. Given the glut of prosecutorial misconduct in our criminal justice system and how they seek a conviction over the truth, vesting them with the ability to put someone to death is just so totally unethical and wrong. Thank you. Let's hear the thoughts from Christopher Marks. Hi. Uh, did you know that preponderance of evidence means, in my opinion, because you have, before giving any thought to evidence, you're just going to make an allegation. Nonetheless, you're doing so underneath the penalty of felony perjury. And when you take somebody into custody by the, through the use of force by an armed officer of the law, at least in state of Indiana, that's called a level two fraudulent felony kidnapping. This happens all across the United States and the taxpayer on a national average is paying about $34,000 a year to keep kidnapped human beings that are probably most times completely innocent. The largest racketeering scheme that is being committed within these United States is not being committed by any organized criminal uh, criminal enterprise. It is it's being organized and committed by the crime syndicate called State of You Fill in the Blank. And we need to put a stop to it. And this is the reason why we need to take federal oversight and reinstate it. We need our federal government to actually take a long, hard look at what our state governments are doing. Because when you leave it up to the state government to actually hold themselves accountable, they will turn a blind eye and embezzle their wages whilst committing extortion against you the common man and woman of this nation. So no, never, absolutely not, should these criminals have any say on who gets put to death. Thank you. And we'll close with Daniel Berman. So uh, Kim brought up some really um, interesting statistics about people who are wrongfully convicted. Um, there's an organization called the Innocence Project. And of course, people always ask me, but without taxes, how will we fill in the blank? The Innocence Project is all funded privately. It's a private organization. It's not, I don't know if they take any government money, but it's mostly, they take donations. It's its volunteers. Um, and they go and they find cases of government abuse where they, they got someone convicted and they're not guilty and they get them released. And so many of these cases, these people have been executed. They're already dead. You can't emphasize this enough. People were captured, convicted, and murdered by the government, and they didn't even do the crime that they were accused of. And it's so easy to see how this happens when, when uh, for one thing, there's poverty. Why? Because government taxation. And what happens when somebody who can't afford a good lawyer gets arrested? Well, the Constitution says you have a right to a lawyer. Well, how, who's going to give you a lawyer? I mean, do they just come from nowhere? Does the court say, well, we're going to give you a lawyer. We're going to pay for it. No, what happens is the prosecutor says, we want to prosecute this person. We want them to go to jail. 
but we have to give we have to constitutionally give them a fair trial. We have to constitutionally play by all these rules. So let's hire an attorney and give them an attorney. And usually when you get these public defenders, the first thing out of their mouth is you should plead guilty. The public defenders take sides with the prosecutors because half the time that's who's paying them. And we have a completely corrupt system where people who are innocent are tricked into agreeing to certain things that will get them convicted and put on death row and have themselves murdered because they don't understand what's going on. They're not educated on the legal system and the government does not give an F about them. Sorry, I'm trying to censor this for your, for your show, Hody. Um, <laughs> Much appreciated. This is a this is a messed up system that we have. And this is that is where we should be focusing our attention. If you want to talk about the death penalty, let's talk about the death penalty. But first, before we start killing people, because maybe there are some people who aren't fit to live on this earth. But before we start killing people, we need to figure out how we're getting these convictions and make sure that we're not wrongfully convicting people first. Thank you so much. The. Uh... Innocence Project is a nonprofit organization, 30501C3. And uh, according to Wikipedia, they have freed more than 362 wrongfully convicted people based on DNA, freed 20 people off of death row, and they aren't just about innocence. They have actually caught 158 real life perpetrators. Great. Let's move on to the next question. Even if you intend to pass no legislation in what I'm about to talk about, your voice will have a great impact on this issue. As it stands, some school districts and professional events, transgender men are winning wrestling and weightlifting events at a high rate, while transgender women are having elevated success in areas like gymnastics. Yet the alternative to leveling this playing field is discriminating against them and placing them in a situation where they must compete with people that they don't identify with. What should the role be of the transgender athlete when it comes to sports? And we are going to start with Daniel Berman. Um, that's an interesting question. And I've always looked at this like, you know, there, there usually there are different um, uh, classes of, of um, opponents in these things. So like when you have boxing, you have different weight classes. Um, I would think that that might solve most of the problem. At the same time, if these are private organizations and they want to adopt these rules, let them adopt the rules. Um, I think it's it's obvious that some people have an unfair advantage, and I think that these organizations should figure out some some way to compensate for that. Maybe it's based on weight or height or or some some variance of that. Um, but I mean, people need to be treated as human beings. Now, at the same time, people who want to there was there was a case of a girl who had her her skull bashed in by a transgender woman who was competing against her. Um, I mean, we talk about performance enhancing drugs. What kind of steroids or, um, or um, hormones are you taking that's, that's changing your, um, your chemical balance? Um, is, is that something that should be taken into consideration? Was this person bigger and stronger? Were they in a completely different weight class? Um, these, these are all really interesting questions. Um, but at the same time, if the, the woman who, who unfortunately had her head bashed in, um, she voluntarily participated in this sport and that's not something that I would want to do myself. Um, I mean, I, I don't know why I would want to subject myself to that, whether it's somebody who's my size or even smaller than me, it's, it's kind of a barbaric sport to begin with. Um, so, you know, when we're talking about track and field, that's a little bit different, but I mean, who always wins those, the taller people, right? Why? Because they have longer legs and they can run faster. It's genetic predisposition. So whether you want to break, break that competition into, um, okay, well, we're going to, we're going to have a track team that's female and, and male because genders they're you know, they're going to compete differently. Um, well, why don't you separate them by height? It, it's really kind of a weird thing that we have. Okay. Uh, let's go to Kim Ruff. Thanks, Hody. So there's a couple things I want to touch on here. One of the things that Daniel said, and I think this is probably more just a, a slip of the tongue more than anything, is he said unfair advantage. I don't actually think that somebody who is trans female competing as a female has an unfair advantage against women who were born biologically female or cisgendered women. I actually, if you know anything about hormone replacement therapy, when you take estrogen, it does decrease your muscle tone. It does decrease your muscle mass. 
you aren't as physically strong as you would have been if you had the same level of testosterone that you had been biologically predisposed to. And the same thing goes in the reverse. If you're taking testosterone because you're a trans male, you're going to increase muscle mass. You're going to increase strength and endurance. That's just the reality, the reality when you're dealing with the endocrine system and this hormone replacement therapy. So it isn't like they aren't commensurate. Additionally, as Daniel very rightly pointed out, there are already existing genetic differences between people in general. It has nothing to do with biological sex or chosen gender. It has everything to do with just genetics. In the case of track and field, as he very rightly pointed out, the people who typically excel at that usually hail from Africa. And it's strictly because they have longer hamstrings. That's just genetics. They cover this in a really great book called The Sports Gene. Should we say to people, should we play this like Harrison Bergeron by Kurt Vonnegut and say, if you want to be a ballerina in order to not upset the other ballerinas, you all need to wear a block, a cinder block around your neck, lest ye be better than? If somebody self-identifies as female or self-identifies as male and they are going through the process of transitioning, there is no rational reason why they should be excluded from participating in the sport that their gender chooses. And quite frankly, as a woman, I hate the fact that we have handicaps in sports. We should be able to try and compete on a level. And if we can't, we're just not good enough. We shouldn't differentiate. All right. Let's hear some thoughts from, I'm sorry, it's not about economy, but Arvin Vora. <laughs> there, are, there are a few issues here. The biggest one is this. When you look at, say, one public school team competing against other, we're trying to figure out what's the fair thing. There should be no public schools. They certainly shouldn't have the luxury of a sports team, and there should be no funding for that of any kind from the government. In terms of a private league, different private leagues will do whatever they want to. I mean, that, that's, that's the point of a private league. This is a, a complicated, growing issue. I don't think anyone has all the answers to it right now. Now, the people who have suggested that, you know, right now it's, it's not really fair to women I mean, it, there's, there's many people I've heard who basically argue that women's, that the existence of women's sports is basically an, if like a, an athletic affirmative action program for women. And that they say basically, as Kim just said, that everybody should just compete at the same level and there shouldn't be separate, separate leagues. And maybe that's what the future is going to hold. Or the future might say, you know, we just want to see biological females who are the fastest runners. And, and if there's a big market for that, I'm sure some company will say, listen, that's what we're providing. And that's the idea here. I, I don't think that the president needs to get up there and say, here's what sports should do. I mean, sports don't rise to the level of national security or anything like that where a president, even by any state of standard, should be involved, let alone by my standard, where I don't think that the president should even really be involved in that. So what should the president do for something like this? I think he should say, listen, there should be no government funding for sports at all, no government funded football stadiums, no government funded public schools, no government funded public school stadiums of any kind. And then let the free market do what it does best. And my prediction is at the end of all of this, the free market will come up with a, an elegant solution that takes this to the next level that's better than anything that we're discussing right now today. The key is to let competition and innovation solve complex problems rather than expecting a president to. Great. Let's uh, move this question to Christopher Marks. Hi. Uh, when I was in high school, I was in wrestling. And something uh, peculiar happened my sophomore year. And that was females started um, arguing that we either needed a female wrestling team or that they should be able to compete against men. And I actually wrestled against a female um, my sophomore year. Uh, she was highly competitive. She, she held her own. And, you know, I feel like that if certain things had happened, she had trained harder, she knew how to do moves better or something along those lines, she could have beaten me. Um, she didn't, but you know, that's here, not, neither here nor there. Um, they, they, it doesn't matter about gender. I don't believe in, I wouldn't even go as far as to saying that just because you have a certain genetic predispos predisposition, um, you can overcome any point of adversity if you work hard enough. Uh, so, 
And as far as regard to what the president can do in this matter, I, quite frankly, I don't think that the government should be involved in this decision. Uh, killed my time. Okay, cool. <laughs> I know you're trying to brag, but I think sophomore year is actually when most men are wrestling with their first female, Chris. Uh, let's go ahead and ask, we'll get the closing thoughts from, from this on ben, uh, with Benjamin Letter. I wish we were in open dialogue already because I want to ask everybody, would would we ask the cake baker to break uh, to bake the, the victory cake for the athlete that transit, you know, <laughs> some, the inconsistency here. But I think there wouldn't be any inconsistency there if we did like Arvin was saying. I was kind of hoping I'd get to go before him because I already knew he would cover it real well. Um, and that is we wouldn't have this problem if the government wasn't involved in sports. If we just let the free market take over sports and stop wasting all this money and it's not happening so much on a federal level, it's happening on everybody's local level. They have these uh, certificate of obligations and these bond deals where they build these stadiums and they, they saddle you with, uh, you know, property taxes and uh, sales tax and, uh, ad valorem, ta all kinds of taxes. There's too many lists. Daniel Berman's probably got a list on his website. Do, right? He will soon if he doesn't. Um, but if we weren't involved, the government was involved in, in school sports stuff, this wouldn't be happening. And, and different leagues would branch out and and people would, would get to enjoy. They'd have more flavors. You know, they'd get to, get to enjoy. Um, so that's a really great incentive, you know, to say, you know what, we've gone way too far with this government spending on things like school sports back away from that, let the private sector take over. And you know what, you might create yourself a job, maybe a job for a friend. All right. Thank you all so much for that. Let's move on to the next question now. Uh, death by assisted suicide is gradually making its way into the public eye, which means that cases are less and less clear cut, but they are still coming to light more frequently. Recently, a 17 year old girl who was raped requested to be euthanized due to her agonizing psychological pain. Her request was declined and so under medical supervision, she refused to eat until she starved to death. On one hand, Approving a death under these circumstances is tantamount to murder, since this patient with care could have hypothetically recovered. On the other hand, if we were to, if we are unable to kill ourselves, what rights do we actually have over our own bodies? What control do we have? Where would you stand on this painful decision, and where do you see the future of this going? And we will start with Kim Ruff. Oh, geez, right after you make me like squeeze out a couple tears over that anecdote. Okay. Um. Well, I am very much an advocate for self-ownership. And to that end, you have every right to do with your body what you so desire, including terminating your life. And if you need to seek assistance because you don't have the capability or means to do it, in the case of someone who is terminally ill and would be unable to give minister the cocktail of drugs necessary to end their life, or even if you just couldn't pull the trigger and you needed somebody to do it for you, it is your life. It belongs to you. And if you want to end it, you have every right to do it. And no one should stop you. I wish though, you know, as a parent, I think about my, my own kids. And I even have conversations like this with my husband, because that's like one of the first things I ask people when I date them is like, if a push came to shove and I didn't want to be alive anymore, I'm not asking you to die for me. I'm asking you like, would you kill me if I asked you to? Because I really think that's like a higher level of devotion because to allow yourself to be traumatized by letting somebody you love die at your own hand, recognizing rightly that their life is their life. That is, it is traumatic and awful and terrible, but that is truly love. I still in all, I would, that, that story breaks my heart and I am so sorry for her family. I yield my time. Yeah. Let's go to Benjamin letter. <clears throat> Um, well, yeah, it's, it's a hard, it's, it's a hard issue. Ultimately people, if people are going to commit suicide, they're going to commit suicide. I mean, I hear, I mean, it, staggering statistics on, on veteran suicide right now. Um, 
So I don't think that any real laws preventing suicide are really having an effect uh, actually preventing any suicides at, at all. I think that what they do is they put a, a, stig a stigma on it. Um, and what they're really doing is they're putting people in situations where they might just end up kind of hurting themselves um, and not doing things right, um, possibly hurting somebody else, you know, people who, uh, you know, kill themselves uh, in uh, garages uh, with turning on their car exhaust and stuff. You could end up killing somebody else with that exhaust um, rather than having a, a safe, a safe environment, which, you know, the, the free market and, and the medical professionals could easily fill this space. And, and some, some have tried to. Now on the, on the other side here, I think it's important that like, we should never encourage people to commit suicide. And I think that there's something kind of wrong in our culture right now. I see a big trend of it, of people jokingly, whether jokingly or not, encouraging people to commit self suicide, telling them to kill themselves or go jump off a bridge. I, th I think it'd be great if we could really stop doing that as a people. All right. Thank you so much. Uh, Christopher Marks, let's get your thoughts on this. In the family rights movement, we have a huge problem with suicide. Um, the family court system itself pushes a great many of people to commit suicide. When you've been financially forced into poverty, when your child is being used as a weapon to emotionally harm you, and after prolonged years upon years of being exposed to this extremely extreme emotional stress, it starts to take its tolls on your physical body. This is a this is an example of a crime the state is committing against people uh, people all across the United States right now. Um, now, as somebody who is a survivor myself. I can, I, I don't agree that this is something that the government should be involved in making rules for or against. But what I do say is that you can overcome anything that is, that is, that is hurt you. That when you have a trauma that you are surviving through, you can in fact overcome it. You can grow and use that adversity as a and, and use it to become a strength. Um, and I would encourage every anybody and everybody that is possibly even considering this to think of what you can do for others, utilizing the trauma that you are surviving through, and not take your own life. I yield my time. All right, uh, Arvin Voyle, Let's hear what you have to say on this one. A tragedy like that, having been amplified and forced to become so much exponentially work, it, worse is it's an unspeakable thing that's happened. And the idea that that somebody would would be in that much pain, it, I think it hurts all of us to even imagine somebody in so much pain that they want to die, uh, not because of of a of a physical thing, but because of a psychological traumatic thing that that it's it's hard for for any of us to really even imagine that to think about it you know you think about your loved ones in, in a situation like that it's very difficult um the the legal aspect of it i think is 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 clear it, it if if an adult has the right to make those types of decisions i wish he had made a different decision i think it's i don't i think you know having worked with so many people and, and met so many people that have found ways to to come through that and come through that in some ways stronger. I, I think that it's, it's, it's a tragedy what happened in that circumstance. I'm reminded of a discussion I had with one of my best friends. He's a spinal surgeon. And somebody came to him asking if, if, if they perform euthanasia essentially. And what he told her he said, there's nothing wrong with you that I can't fix in two hours. Now imagine this, imagine if she hadn't had the if, the, if this patient hadn't had the ability to just go to a doctor and ask that kind of question, she might have tried to kill herself over a procedure because of the sheer agonizing pain she was constantly in over a procedure that could that where she was cured in two hours. 
when you cut people off from help, you end up with worse decisions, not better. When people are at the end of life or just dealing with a disease that's so terrible that they can't even control their own body, then yes, they need, they have the right to ask somebody to help them. And of course, somebody has the right to say, no, I don't want to help you. That's, there, there are two sides of this. There's the doctor's conscience and the person's conscience. I don't think there's that the state's conscience, though, has any place in this discussion at all. Thank you, Arvin. And let's get the closing words on this from Daniel Berman. So um, one of the most important things to realize about this is that we are not government property. To have any kind of law that says you can or cannot kill yourself or have somebody else help you do it is to say that you are someone else's property and someone else has a higher claim of right in your own body and your own life than you do yourself. Um, we've seen, you know, this, this happens all the time. If you live out in the country um, or you've probably seen it on a movie, if you don't, there's a sick animal that's been injured and there's nothing you can do. There's no vet close by. You don't have any way to transport it. Maybe it's a big animal like a deer. You put it out of its misery. You kill it. And when we think about this with humans, of course, it's a lot more emotional because this is another human being and it's a, it's a little bit more of a sensitive issue than that. But the, important, the reason that we do this is because it's worse to make them suffer. Um, it's, uh, you know, I had, to, I had to see this happen with my mom. She had this disease that um, like towards the end, she had it for a really long time, but towards the end, she was in the hospital and she was screaming so loud that you could hear her practically on the other end of the hospital. And this was when they were giving her so much morphine that they didn't understand how she could even feel the pain. And it was like the skin on her entire body was on fire. She was screaming so much. They finally got her to a point where, where she could sleep. And they used the euphemism, we're just going to make her as comfortable as she can, um, as she can be. And all they were doing was they were giving her heroin, morphine. They, were, they basically killed her. They euthanized her. And this is kind of a standard practice that's already done now. But to, to say that that's wrong, and this is, you know, there's experts in this disease and they haven't been able to solve that problem to say that that's wrong and you should not do that. And you should force her to be alive is to say that you think that it is better for her to suffer through all of that pain for however many days or weeks or months without end and feel that you want to torture this person because you're not comfortable with them ending their own life. And that is wrong. You have no right to their life. All right. Thank you so much, candidates, for your thoughts on that. Uh, let's get into something a lot more fun. Let's talk about religion for a second here, uh, just because that's so much less controversial, right? Yeah. Would you help lead the change to forbid any references to gods of any religious persuasion on our currency, government buildings, and or public areas? Simple question. Let's start where we left off. Daniel Berman. That is an interesting question. Um, no, I, I don't think we should put God on anything unless it's private property. If you want to have your own pro property, absolutely do it. If you want to have your own schools and they're funded by your church, absolutely do it. Um, you know, we we come into this competition where, you know, what happens when the government is saying, well, this is a tax funded organization and we're going to put God on here. Well, does government then start favoring one religion over another? Or do the, as the Satanists have, have showed, come along and say, well, if you're going to put a statue of your God here, we're going to put a statue of our God here and the taxpayers have to pay for it because we have to treat each religion equally. Um, it's kind of nonsensical. And the, the reality is government has no role in religion. That's not even their job. It's government's job is not to spread religion or teach people what to think or believe, it's to protect our rights. And that's simply it. It doesn't need to put the word God on anything. Okay, thank you so much. Let's go to Kim Ruff. So this question has two aspects to it. The first aspect is obviously about the separation of church and state and making no law, either favoring or penalizing. And I'm, of course, in the opinion that that should be the case, that you should not mix the two. You shouldn't commingle. That being said, we already have these things. They already exist. We have our currency has got references to God to it. We have references to God in, you know, courthouses and the Ten Commandments on courthouse steps and the extraordinary amount of money and energy and effort just to extract that and to have something that's absent that is incredibly wasteful and dumb. If anybody has their Jimmy so 
rustled by the fact that those things are referenced. I will remind them this was part of our culture, just as your culture was part of you once. We've evolved past that. Don't do it anymore. But why waste the time trying to get rid of it? Just don't do it anymore. That's all I have to say about that. All right. You're... I'm in Utah, so there's a lot of Russell Jimmies out here. Uh, Ar- <laughs> Arvin Vora, what do you think? Well, I- I'm going to have to once again disagree with, a little, with you a little bit, Hody, Damn because it. when I look at my currency or currencies, you know, Bitcoin, Dash, and all these, I don't see God referenced there at all. Nice. When it comes to the Federal Reserve, to the U.S. Treasury Department, I don't think the government should be involved in currency at all. And so as president, the first thing I'm going to do is, is pardon every single person who is has been arrested or fined or punished for for using Bitcoin for minting their own currency? Uh, for example, the Ron Paul the silver dollars that went out a while a while back, and of course that person got arrested. I'm going to pardon all of those people. I think we need to have competing currency in the United States, and some of those currencies are probably going to say God on it. If somebody hands me a, a, a an ounce of silver that has a picture of God or or has a has the word God or has a picture of Satan or the word Satan. I don't care as long as it's legitimate real silver or some other currency that has some amount of purchasing power. Uh, when it comes to the courtrooms, it, to, to me, we're just not going to need that many courtrooms at all when, when it comes down to this, because we simply won't need that many courtrooms when you get rid of all the victimless crimes. Uh, in terms of, of people getting their jimmies rustled, as, as, as Kim just mentioned, you know, as, as something that goes around intentionally trying to trigger people, when I do see that stuff, to me, it sets a bad standard because when you see the Ten Commandments in a courtroom, well, or, or near a courtroom, you, that, that to me is a problem because those commandments don't reflect any kind of law. Monotheism is not a law. While I think it's good to be respectful of your parents, I don't think that honor thy father and mother needs to be a law. I don't think it's so important that you don't take any God before this God. That And, and so... That paves the way to people trying to legislate morality. We need to have a separation of church and state. Morality of any kind should not be legislated. And we need to have a lot fewer courtrooms in the United States of America and a lot more free market. Cool. Let's move that along to Benjamin Letter. You know, uh, at the founding, I, I, I thought, you know, we were all told that there was supposed to be a, a separation of church and state, but I don't think they got that necessarily right from the founding because we have all of these things, as, as Kim said, and they're there. And it's, it, it's, it's expensive and it's a huge undertaking to, to get rid of them. And I don't think we should make some big ceremony about it or effort at all. Um, the reality is, like Arvin said, new currencies are forming that don't have uh, any of that. Um, and we probably don't need as many courtrooms and, and, and all these government buildings as it is. And a lot of them should be sold off and we should close down and, and efficientize. Um, I mean, think of how many municipal court, what, why do you need a municipal courtroom? You could, you could run a municipal courtroom off a zoom meeting like we're having right now. And, and it would, save a lot of people a lot of time um, if you really wanted to do that. Um, so I don't know, we do things in this country sometimes in some ways like it is still the 1800s. Uh, and, and we need to modernize the things that, that we do. Uh, and this, this needs to happen throughout government. Um, and I think if we did that, that we would need less infrastructure and, and all that in the first place. Like, has already been said. I think libertarians are pretty much in agreement on on this this issue. I, I don't ever hear a lot of argument in the party about about this. Yeah, it's. I, if I didn't know any better, I'd feel like you guys all wanted to end the Fed or something. Let's no. uh, let's get our closing thoughts on this question from Christopher Marx. Yeah, uh, so is separation of church and state was pretty clear. Don't know why it wasn't actually understood. Uh, probably some of the most basic reading of the English written language um, that I can imagine anybody doing. Uh, but should we 
should we utilize somebody else's assets to pave over this blatant idiotic uh, rhetoric? No. Um, if people wanted to voluntarily consent to paving over said it said markings, um, I don't necessarily think that I would disagree with that uh, as long as something else didn't go up uh, it, that would constitutionally uh, or would go against our constitutional principles. So yeah, but like Kim said, it's already there. I don't see the point in wasting the time and covering it up, um, but yeah, it shouldn't be done. As far as Federal Reserve, that ending the Fed thing is part of my agenda. Um, so not really too concerned about what the Federal Reserve Banking Institution does Great. Thank you so much, guys. Well, that concludes the formal questions. We uh, we actually have plenty of time. I mean, at least 10, 12 minutes to ask some, ask some questions from all the rest of the guys here, see what the Facebook guys had to say. Let's start uh, with one that I didn't get to. Uh, and I'm just going to throw it out there generally to talk about, just to give you something to talk about. But let's talk about affirmative action. Oh, yeah. Yay. <laughs> wasn't, wasn't some of that overturned a few years ago? You know, as a, okay, so affirmative action, I mean, God, we talked about this a little bit earlier where we were discussing the, whether or not there should be discrimination or certain privileges conferred on certain groups of people or certain penalties applied. And as affirmative action is to me as a woman, so incredibly cruel because it's basically saying that you can't do it on your own merit that you don't have the innate skills or abilities to accomplish this on your own. So you need a hand up and a handout. I find it That's so very offensive and it's over. very diminishing too, because then whatever success you achieve, did you truly achieve that success or did you only get that job because of title nine or some other nonsense? Mm -hmm. There is something so wickedly wrong about how the Democrats use legislation and they say they're doing it in order to care for people because they're the party of the people. But what they're effectively doing is telling people through this constant messaging and these government policies that they'll never be good enough. I am so opposed to affirmative action. I would love to see nothing more than an even playing field where people start at effectively the same level and then they could achieve great success because they applied themselves, because they had those not that knowledge, skills and abilities, not because they happen to possess certain body parts or happen to have certain skin color or hailed from a different ethnic background. That's just an absurd reason to give somebody some other benefit. I think the best way to handle that is to see the great success at racial integration in sports. No one ever says, oh, that person is on the NBA or NFL or wherever because of their race. Whereas even in states, for example, there are states where it's illegal to do any college discrimination based on race. But when somebody who's a minority gets into, the, into that college, people are always whispering, yeah, they just got in because of their race, even if it is legally impossible. That's the culture it's created. And so the people who have legitimate gains are just basically, it's, it's negated. You know, if you look at the actual history, I mean, the, the first open heart surgery in, in the world, actually, was done by an African-American man. And that type, that type of racial trailblazing could be happening in every single area or gender based trailblazing could be happening in every single area. If you just let it happen, we need to have a Jackie Robinson of all these different areas. And the tragedy is we have already had Jackie Robinson of every single area, computers, medicine, whatever. And the Democrats, I mean, fairly, this is mostly a Democrat thing, have masked that and essentially forced people to keep on believing that they need to be dependent. Affirmative action, it hurts everybody, but it most tragically hurts the people who it's supposed to help because it prevents them from ever living with dignity, self-respect, pride, and really gaining what they should be gaining as free and independent citizens. I think as yeah, a minority I, here. Absolutely true that, uh, you know, the Democratic Party seems to really rely upon this narrative of the, the collective of, of victims and they tell people that they're a victim and they train people to be a victim. 
it's just it's really horrible. They're really kind of perpetrating a cultural crime upon upon this country, you know, and, and somebody hit the Republicans, too. But I've just seen that for a while. And I think it's gross. Uh, if you take like any any aspect of anybody's life, there's somebody better than you at probably a dozen, a million things. Right. I mean, nobody's nobody's the best at everything. So what's interesting about like any of these programs, whether it's welfare or affirmative action or any of these is you can pick literally any person in the entire country and you can say your life would be so much better if government would do something for you and lift you up because you're not as good as everybody else. So they're really putting everybody down by this. And it's really a shame because you don't get to focus, you get to focus on what you don't have. And it starts making you feel like less of a person instead of saying, this is what you're really good at. You should focus on this and you should get ahead on that. Um, and we need somebody to tell us this. Like I hear so many times like, oh yeah, you, you know, um, uh, whether myself or somebody else, oh yeah, well they were lucky because they were born into a good family. They were, they were born around somebody that, you know, maybe they didn't have much growing up, but at least they had somebody inspiring them and motivating them and, and telling them all these things. Um, that's actually really true. That helps somebody become successful. Um, you need to constantly, um, you know, reassure people like, Hey, you might not be good at everything, but you're, you just need to find what you're good at. Um, and that's not really government's role. And of course, government is really bad at it. What they're really good at is getting everybody dependent on them. And this is what the Democrats do a lot. They say they find, you know, everything like, you know, whether it's your race, whether it's the city you're born in, anything, they can find something to make you feel inadequate and tell you, hey, just vote for us and we'll control everything because that's ultimately what they want, but we'll control it in your benefit. And that's where they screw everybody over. And of course, they do it in the name of taxes. Well, look at how the, the Republicans have been playing everybody on guns. Look at this. Bomb stocks, silencers, wasn't even really an issue uh, under under Obama, but Trump is somehow getting away with this. What what? How is that? And why why are Republicans still like clinging to this this lie that the Republican Party is pro Second Amendment? It's what every they're blindly following, following, following their parties. Thing. They always say that the other person is going to beat you up more than I will. So stick with me because I'm going to only break some of your bones. They're going to break even more of your bones. It's, it's just, it's just the, the abuse, it's okay. psychological abuse that the GOP is doing to Republican voters, most of whom are actually great and decent people. The two-party system in itself is a choice between two different types of crap sandwich. You can get yourself your pig sandwich or your bull sandwich, and they may be both GMO-free, free-range, uh, fed, but you're still having to eat a crap sandwich either way about it. And I think that that's one of the things that the Libertarian Party can actually do. We are a people. Uh, we are a party that puts the people's rights and interests above state and corporate privilege and interest. We do a we do a follow up, but like a nice transition nod to what the Republicans do in regard to our 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 beliefs in the free market and how we can actually limit government, which would overall decrease the overall tax base. That would make it to where corporations are more profitable as well as the people. Um, we have a very good social a a very good social atmosphere in regard to our policies as well. We want individual ownership and as well as individual rights. Um, I don't see why it is that the people have this constant need to fall back into, like I watched Kim Ruff's, uh, like the 10 minute video of Kim Ruff on uh, uh, Judge Napoleo or- <laughs> <laughs> or whatever Come on, Dan. You don't know the judge. Yeah. <laughs> um, I, you know, I kind of have this mental block that when it comes down to all judges, they're all either Gandalf, Harry Potter, Harry Potter, or Hermione. Like, I mean, like it's all just a very bad magician's word uh, cosplay. Um, I want to I hear more from Kim Ruff about that interview. You think you got a, a fair shake? You think he did you right? Yeah, no, I thought it was very even handed and I, I thought the questions were very fair. Um, I don't have any objection to anything that he asked. I think what was a little unnerving about it is, is just that, like I was telling you guys, the setup 
where you are in an isolated studio and you're effectively looking at a mark on the wall and you're listening to an earpiece and you're trying to talk to somebody as though you're sitting next to them. So you miss all of the nonverbal cues that naturally feed into a conversation, but you're still trying to make it look for a live audience like it's nonverbal. It was very weird. And but so that was that was a little bit interesting. And then the other thing is just dealing with that very compressed timeline. You know, because he he has an intro and he 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 let me know ahead of time. This is what we're going to I'm going to do this opening segment, this ad. And then I have a a little bit of a a monologue I'm going to give. And then we'll go into the interview But the interview itself. I mean, it wasn't more than maybe six or seven minutes. And he asked me, I don't know, maybe 10 questions that I had to answer in six or seven minutes. So that was that was very interesting. It was very interesting. Did you know the questions ahead of time? No, I had no idea what he was going to ask me. I kind of figured based on his monologue where he was going to take it, what direction he wanted to go in. But no, I, I didn't realize, I didn't know what he was going to ask. I actually, I, I suspected, I thought he was going to ask me more about the Mueller report and what my opinion is on whether or not Trump should be impeached. So I <laughs> I read that whole goddamn thing <laughs> prepping for it. <laughs> and I was like, come on. <laughs> if you get, as you get to the the higher the profile the interview is, the shorter it's going to be and the more just brutally fast. And you're just like, what was that the whole thing? <laughs> right. I got to tell you guys this story because it'll crack you up. I think I told Arvin this on Saturday, but years ago, the Goldwater Institute here in Arizona had filed a lawsuit against the city of Glendale against crony capitalism. They had effectively offered subsidies to the Phoenix Coyotes to keep their stadium here. So they the Goldwater Institute filed a lawsuit against them for doing so. And they needed plaintiffs and being part of the Libertarian Party and vehemently opposed to corporatism. I signed on as a plaintiff because I was then a resident of that city. And I was the only person of like the five plaintiffs that they're like, okay, you're young and female. You should be the one interviewed by the media. So the media came to my house. They talked to me for like 30 minutes. And the only segment they use is me going, well, you see, taxes are bad. (laughs) That was it. And I'm like, oh, come on. I had a whole great argument. I explained to you why corporatism is wrong. And all you get is taxes are bad. Like, oh my God. (laughs) No, no, I didn't even, well, we weren't doing that thing at that time. This was like way back in 2009 or so. So yeah. I'm pretty sure. He wants that clip. Right. Daniel's got copyright on that now. I actually went to the patent office and he's got that trademarked. So you, I owe him like a nickel. Every, everybody owes him a nickel every time they say it. it it's bad. Oh, um, you know what? I'll get it for you. We'll just do taxes are and then you can shop in the or something. Yeah. You know? <laughs> <laughs> Tax, taxes are gross and weird, right? Right, Arvin? Uh, there is one. Amen to that, Hody. Amen to that. <laughs> I know we only have a couple of minutes uh, left to the open segment, but I did have, I had two people kind of talk about a similar subject, and these are under comments. They weren't asked directly as questions, but I think it would be great to get your guys' perspective on both of them. Uh, this is from Amanda and Christina, and they're going through similar situations. One of them is, uh, was the, uh, in the, I guess both of them, both of them were foster or one of them was a foster parent, knew Medicaid, wanted to adopt it, and has to wait a year before she can adopt it. Is waiting the year-long period. After she has farmed up the money, I have another one who wants to adopt but can't farm up the money, so she's looking into foster parenting first. What message would you have? And, and I mean, I don't know if you can, but keep it in like 30 seconds range but what do you guys what would the message be to people like christina and amanda who are having problems with both the timeline and the expense of trying to adopt a child that they've met and have fallen in love with with a free free market clearinghouse it should be essentially instantaneous it should also not be very expensive so that's one thing the other thing though is if you don't have the money yet to to whatever that amount of money is you should really think very carefully before raising a kid that you can't afford, even if you adopt a kid, I still believe that using welfare schools, government schools, all that is still morally wrong. And you want to set the best moral standard, the best moral example you can for anybody that you look after, whether a biological or a fi- or an adopted child. I don't know. What, what are we waiting? What is she wait? What are we waiting for a year? What, what takes a year? Bureaucracy, honey. That's what it is. It's just nonsense. Is it's it no other reason. It's like not like they're, period? 
Well, matter. there's partially a waiting period, but the other aspect is strictly just bureaucracy. Like it's just this, the it's state CPS practices require the a require the child to be in the state's care for a was. 12 or 15 out of the last 22 months, it, it, at least here in Indiana, the statute has moved down to 12 wow. months before the state can terminate the parent's rights. So what I would say to these two young ladies is this, do not get yourself involved in the human trafficking of somebody else's kidnapped child. Make sure that the child that you are going to be considering adopting did not come through CPS. We need to starve out CPS um, and the state as well. We cannot continue contributing to the human trafficking of people's children and financing the greed and corruption of the state government. That's Amen. a good plan, but is that is that realistic to believe that, um, I mean, if, if good people aren't adopting that that bad people are not going to have more to choose from, more to adopt and, and do what they will. Um, I don't know if that's, I mean, we definitely need to get rid of the system, but that's something to consider. Yeah, but well, I mean, here in Aaron- just have kids and abuse them. I mean, it, that's absolutely true too. It's because here in Arizona, we have quite possibly the worst CPS. We call it the Department of Child Services. It's DCS here. And they really do actually take kids from people on the most specious of arguments, the, the flimsiest of grounds. And they will keep them for a certain period of time so that those parental rights are terminated because the argument will be made, well, if our child's been in our custody for nine to 12 months, then they're no longer emotionally attached to their parents. Therefore, it's not healthy for them to return to that previous environment. And they are in turn given to other families. It's terrifying what they do. A dear friend of mine out here is an advocate for families that have been victimized by DCS. I don't believe that crappy people are going to somehow like fill in and take those kids through the foster system. I think if we actually understood how jacked up it is and we stopped feeding into it and focused strictly on private adoption, we would starve the beast. Mm -hmm. Amen. Also, I mean, uh, I, I've I just, seen so many people that like the, the DPS comes to their house with a police officer and they look threatening and they say like, yeah, we need to come in and we need to see your child. And but too many people just don't ask, do you have a warrant? They can't come into your house unless they're like vampires, unless you invite them in. Um, and Actually, don't, unless they have warrants. That's inaccurate. And it happens all across the United States where CPS will actually privately contract with your County sheriffs and actually go and break and enter into your home without a warrant. They know that they don't have the warrant. They know that they don't have it, that they're breaking the law and they will still do it and kidnap your child. I am a father. The reason why I'm in the family rights activist is because my son, my youngest son was in state's custody for 20 months. I lost my job fighting to get my son out of the state's custody. I lost everything fighting to get my son out of the state's custody not because of something that i did i was the non-offending parent they fraudulently claimed that i committed child neglect because i didn't prevent his mother who i was not with from committing physical harm against him um and then they returned him to her while she was under investigation for another child abuse allegation this has been a pattern of my child's life for the for the entirety of his seven year his seven years of life at this point, and I am the and I'm the one that I fought to get custody modified to me, but they refused to do so. So yes, I can tell you firsthand that when my child came out of that twenty months of state custody, being shuffled back around back and forth between the different places being placed in a placed into a ther into a therapist agency that actually conspired through email with the judge and the and what we here in Indiana call a department of child services to make up a false story to alienate me from my child for 202 days they will commit perjury they will commit fraud they will kidnap your children they will hold your children for the ransom so they can get those federal dollars that are being mismanaged through your social security trust fund.
the state is the biggest child uh, child welfare abuser or a the, child the, the biggest social this, security these laws, these laws are on the state level right the majority of all these laws are on each independent state or these are federal laws it's both no these actually these uh, these stem from the social security act of 1974 as many today they're being a, a, they they're dispersed um per the federal at the federal level from the health and human services out to the state's agencies um and through in the form of block grants yep. um the CPA, the child support collection agencies at lay, at least here in Indiana, the child the child support collection agencies are a division of the county prosecuting attorney. The pro, a county prosecuting attorney is getting massive amounts of federal funds uh, or uh, through those block grants that are coming out to this state. Um, and these, in, like at least the DCS in uh, Indiana in 2017 alone cost this taxpayers 1.2 billion dollars and that was the year that my son was in the state's custody i did want to uh i, I love your guys comments on this we do have to get wrapping up here uh <laughs> i hate i hate to wrap it up especially when it's such a personal story but the uh time demands and facebook cuts me off after two hours so let's do this uh closing statements about social issues and let's start with daniel berman Three minutes taxation on all these, by theft. the way. Three minutes. Go ahead. Um, I, I don't have much to say other than taxation is theft. Um, you know, like a lot of these, um, a, a lot of politicians come to us and they tell us, hey, we're going to make your life better. Um, we're going to vote for us and we're going to do something that's going to make your life so much better. We're going to give you jobs. We're going to give you welfare. We're going to give you whatever they're going to give you. Um, we're going to give you equality. They just sell you all this wonderful stuff, but the reality is all they're doing is they're, there's free cheese and a mousetrap. They're tricking you into voting them back into power so that they can take something and control your life in some other way. Um, that's all they're doing. Uh, we need to recognize this because the more they, once we start to wake up to this and we start to, we stop falling for their tricks, um, they're going to have less control over us. So whether it's whether it's social programs, um, whether it's uh, social engineering, whether it's them deciding who gets to live and who gets to die, um, you know, there are some people who who support abortion um, not because they think like oh it's going to help people, but because they want people of other races to start disappearing. There are people who think like that, and it might not be a majority of people in government. But there are people who think like that, and that's really important to consider. Um, there, you know, when people say they are for abortion or against abortion, they have all kinds of reasons. Uh, some people say it's because of taxes, um, you know, and, and some people say it's because of one reason, and really they feel it's because of another reason. We really need to understand this. Um, also, it's really interesting to see that, like, while a lot of people think, like, hey, we need to take care of people, and we need all these social welfare programs. Um, there was, uh, I think it was uh, New Hampshire or Vermont that had a welfare program. And instead of saying, hey, we're going to drug test all these people like they did in Florida, um, what they said was, if you're able-bodied and you're receiving welfare, um, what we're going to do is we're going to ask you to do some amount of community service in exchange for this money. What happened was 80% of those people dropped off the program and said, hey, if I'm going to work for money, I might as well go get a real job and earn some real money instead of these little pennies that you're giving me. Um, so it's, you know, when you create these programs and you give people an easy way to get stuff, um, it's, it lowers your value because just like these people saw, they were receiving a little bit of money, but their lives were kind of miserable because they were getting the bare minimum because they weren't putting any effort into it. Um, but then once they had, once they had that incentive to be lazy taken away, um, they actually went and empowered their own lives and they have better lives now because of it. So I know a lot of people are struggling right now. Um, I know it's uh, your cost of living is difficult um, to get by. Just remember, all of these things are taxes. Taxes are the reason your rent is so high. Taxes are the reason it's so expensive to get food in some cities. Um, taxes are the reason uh, transportation is so expensive to get to a, a decent job. This is all government taxes. We need to get rid of all these taxes, and a lot of these problems are really going to start solving themselves. Taxation is theft, and check out Berman2020.com. 
Awesome. Thank you, Daniel. It's not a conversation about social issues unless we finish talking about taxation, right? Uh, <laughs> let's move along to uh, Arvind Vora. I'm going to break every rule in debate by closing, by starting my closing statement with a quote from a competitor. Kim Ruff once, and by once, I mean a few minutes ago, said that we should all be able to agree that you shouldn't, unless you're a total sociopath, that you shouldn't kill people or kidnap them or steal from them. And I think that's really the basis of any kind of social or political morality. Today, our social issues have become a distraction from the fundamental social issue. And this fundamental social issue is, what does it mean to live a moral life? What does it mean to live a life where you're not stealing from somebody, where you're not killing somebody, where you're not kidnapping them? And to me, it, it means a few things. When it, when it comes to parenting, it means providing. If you're a parent, it is your job to provide. It is not your job to have the government steal from somebody else to provide for you. And every single parent has the ability to choose either homeschooling or free market education. Over the last few years, I've had the blessing of having so many people first spend a few months yelling and screaming at me, but of that, a pretty significant percentage has then changed and tried homeschooling. And not only has that improved their lives, it saved their kids from the worst type of education that could possibly exist. So many people have had made those changes because of people, you know, the of people like the buns who are, who are here today, people like me, people like all you guys who have kept at it, who have said, listen, you can do better than that. And every one of them, just like the people that Dan just mentioned, every one of those people who went away from the welfare system and to the system of, of, of dignity and providing, they're happier for it. And certainly their kids are happier for it. When we come to that larger level, when, when it comes to the idea that you shouldn't kill people, yeah, you shouldn't kill people. And that's why I've so strongly advocated for young men and women to refuse to enlist in the military, to refuse to be part of the police, to refuse to be part of state-sanctioned state murder, because the state saying murder is okay doesn't make it okay. State-sanctioned death penalty, killing somebody via the death penalty who didn't do anything is wrong, even when the state said it was okay to do. And the state sending you to kill civilians overseas who didn't do anything is also wrong. Both of those are equally wrong. When it comes to kidnapping, don't join the police. Don't be there. If there's no one who's in the police, then there won't be a police state. We won't be kidnapping other people if we simply make those moral choices. The moral choices we need to make come down to one moral choice. Refuse to be part of the state. Do not engage in government schooling. Do not join the military. Do not use any state resources when you can use private ones instead. The biggest successes in the libertarian movement have been people voluntarily choosing to not join the state. And if you want to do that, please do. And if you want to help other people discover that choice, please join my campaign at votevora.com. Awesome. Thank you so much, Arvin. Uh, three minutes. Kim Ruff, your turn. Oh, now I feel obligated to quote Arvin. <laughs> You've already done that enough times. You're fine. <laughs> No, you know, actually, I, w I will. And uh, because it does dovetail into a very important point. One of the biggest things that Arvin obviously focuses on is eliminating the welfare state, particularly with respect to public education. And the reason why that is so incredibly critical is because it is the place where our young children are indoctrinated into this mindset that government is the cure for all that ails us. When we first set out to have this debate, I thought to myself, like, what the heck are we going to say? It's going to take us all of maybe 10 minutes tops because one of us is going to lead and say exactly what's true. And all the balance of us are going to say ditto. I thought it would be very, very short, but instead it becomes more complex because as we start to discuss these social issues, we look at the human element and we look at how humans are currently responding to these events using government and why they are indeed using government. And it is all comes back to the fact that we are involved in public education and it is telling us every single day that this is the way it is. That government is a cure for all that ails us, even when government is the very thing that ails us. This is the great lie that our entire society is built upon. And in the process of perpetuating this lie, we cause the greatest amount of harm on other people. And that is what's at the core of this people, individuals, human beings with lives, with souls, with needs, wants, and desires, all their own. And we penalize them 
because we look to government to make a one-size-fits-all statement, to be the panacea for unique individuals who cannot be lumped into one. I was, we were in Ohio this past weekend, Arvin, Chris Marks, and I, and my friend Sarah, Sarah Stewart, she's a sex worker advocate, and one of the things that she discussed was about mitigating harm. It's about harm management, harm reduction. When she talks about sex worker advocacy, she recognizes that a lot of people conflate sex worker rights with somehow making sex trafficking possible. But that's not really true, and the statistics don't bear out. And the fact of the matter is, is because we find it morally reprehensible as this puritanical society, or because we don't totally understand all the nuances of sex work, we penalize. And an entire group of people is treated like common criminals, penalized and harmed. They are put in prison. They have their property taken from them. They have their lives destroyed. And why? Because once again, we're using government to make decisions about how individuals should run their lives. And that's really what it boils down to. We need to stop looking to government to tell us who to be and who we are and what makes us wonderful and why we should go that way and not the other. And instead, find our own path to bliss. There is no one size fits all. Every man has their journey. And our journey is begins and ends with freedom. My name is Kim Ruff. I'm running for president. You can learn more about me at RuffPhillips2020.com. Three minutes on the button. Thank you so much. Let's put another three minutes on the clock. Benjamin Letty, let's have your closing statement. Yeah, this one was was more interesting uh, than I thought it was going to be. It's going to be, um, it was, uh, it was fun as always. Uh, I guess I'm going to take the time to, to say some things. Um, as far as like, I'm concerned, we can, we can talk about, uh, social issues and economic issues and all these issues, but in, until we get some libertarians in, in local office and develop, developing that reputation in the community that uh, if people in those communities can see that uh, these are more than just principles and platitudes that government really has led us down a really bad path. Uh, pretty much everything we talked about tonight was just a result of government being over-involved in something that it, it shouldn't be. And what a waste of time, because you know that those people are all robbing us blind while we're sitting here arguing about this, that they don't care about any of this stuff and it's all just a scam to get votes from people <clears throat> so that's why i ask people to back your local libertarian candidates and start running for libertarian you know running for office local city council create sanctuary cities sanctuary counties start fending off this uh this intrusion into our lives i, I heard about a, a city, city, people are calling for uh, all kinds of sanctuaries against you know surveillance uh sanctuaries to respect gun rights uh the sanctuaries on, on immigration uh even uh, shroom sanctuaries there's a couple of cities where you know they, they've declared themselves sanctuaries for that this is where i think that the fight is going to happen and, and and to my other candidates here i want to do something different that hasn't i've never seen done before and i want us to start creating a conversation right now about who are the people we don't need just a mere presidential candidate we need an entire administration we need to start figuring out who these secretaries cabinet members and all these people are on the day that one of us was to happen to take office we need to have all those people ready to go right now and already a consensus developed that these are the kind of people that we're looking for these are the kind of qualifications that we're looking for this is the type of character that we're looking for uh so i'm sure we can all work on that uh my my uh, website's benletter.com. Uh, it was it was great. Be sure to check all these people's websites out too, and like keep back in your local candidates. Awesome, thanks, Ben. Let's get the closing of the closing statements from Christopher Marks. Sure, you can trust the government. Ask an American Indian. Hi. Christopher Marks of the Indiana Miami people, the indigenous Miami, uh, the, the indigenous people that were originally in what is now known as state of Indiana. As you've heard here today, I think you can, it, that there is clear and convincing evidence in support of the leading government 
the leading organized crime syndicate is your very own governing body. And you need to take a look at them and find out who exactly needs to be thrown in jail. Now, while we also unilaterally agree that the non-aggressive principle is a, a non-aggression principle is a very firm belief within the, within the libertarian, libertarian party, there is some debate as far as to how, uh, what kind of leniencies we need to offer to public officials that are exhibiting certain narcissistic and sociopathic personality tra character traits. So, if you'd like to learn more about me, you can find me on Facebook. It's Christopher Marks President 2020. I will be opening, uh, starting up a website I'm currently developing, and I am always looking for individuals to come join the Marks for 2020 administration because I already know within this fine panel a couple of people that I'd like to see sit within that administration already. Thank you. Thank you so much, guys. I really appreciate all your comments and your thoughts on this one. I know social issues, uh, it may not seem as pressing as the economic issues or even as fun to talk about sometimes, but they impact a great deal of people and they're a great evangelistic tool to reach out with people to prove that you are a human being and not a libertarian robot. And so I just wanted to thank you guys for your comments on that. And again, for making time for this entire thing. We are going to skip a week. In two weeks, I will be camping. So ordinarily, we go every other week. But our next one will be on the 27th. Join us in the same place. We're Libertarians Podcast. We're going to be talking on criminal justice on June 27th. Same time, same place. You know where to do it. Again, candidates, thank you so much. And everybody else, just keep fueling the fires of liberty.